uh, a conic constant which is minus. Well, I don't mean to go. The 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 conic constant if it's if it's less than minus one, it's a hyperbola. It was supposed to be minus one point zero zero two two three. Instead, it turned out to be this number. That introduced spherical aberration. It was due to the fact that the yardstick they used was was inadvertently miscalibrated. They, there was a, a, a spacing error in between mirrors in a thing they call the reflective no corrector. And they launched the sucker. And so we, we got up there and they were trying to they were trying to focus it. Focus, focus. Well, turned out it wasn't focus. So briefly, okay. Briefly, my involvement with that. I, I've been working on Hubble for years. And uh, so it was launched in 1990 and uh, in April. And I went down to the American Astronomical Society meeting in Albuquerque that week of the, in, in June, wanting to see some Hubble science. Well, there, there was none. The next Tuesday, I was eating lunch in my office in Boulder. And the manager came in and said, you and Merck Bottoma need to be on a plane this afternoon, going to be a big meeting at Goddard uh, tomorrow. Went out to that meeting, they announced to the scientists who've been working for 30 years and then later to the world about the problem. And everyone said, we can't do any science. We can't. Anyway, so then, th then the committee started. Then we started, how to fix it, how to fix it. Uh, I was working on a thing called the Sp Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph, which if we had more time I could describe that, but it's, it's, it's an axial instrument and it has a, 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 a spectrometer with three detectors in it and it operates from the uh, UV 115 nanometers out to a micron or so. Uh, and um, so I presented to a thing called the Hubble Independent Optical Review Panel on number one, what was the aberration? How did it affect it? How could it be fixed? And how well did we need to know it? As a, the one question was, which mirror is it on, and how big is it? And they went through all kinds of stuff. Observations, uh, in and out of focus, uh, ground truth, they called sorting through the fossil record, and they discovered th what the problem was. Uh, so that went on for several months. Uh, the instruments that, felt that, that, that followed, I, I did, I'd lead the optical designer on four of the five of them, uh, they each carry the fix. The, the telescope has not been fixed. It's the instruments that go up carry the fix. So, um, so this may be more detailed. Okay, here, 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 here in general, you can see it over here. Here, here. here in general is how we fix it. We have way out here is the primary mirror. And, it, and it, 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 it's what's called the stop of the system, the aperture stop. And it has the air on it. So, we, we re-image that with this mirror, we re-image that onto this mirror. This is a spherical mirror, and it forms an image of the primary on this mirror. This mirror is a potato chip mirror. It's shaped like a potato chip, almost. It's an anamorphic A-sphere, which means it's toric, has a, the, 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 the radius curvature this direction and this direction are different, like a donut, and on, on the surface, it has um, aspheric, non-spherical non uh, components of, uh, called of fourth and sixth order. So it's a funny shaped mirror, but it exactly compensates for the optical path difference error on the primary mirror. Uh, so we, did, we, we do that for each instrument. Uh, and this particular one, my baby, Advanced Camera for Surveys, uh, has this mirror here, this mirror, and then goes back here. There's that. That's a, a UV detector. That's a a um, very high resolution uh, camera through a filter wheel. Uh, and then this particular channel is also on there. Has a bigger field of view, 200 by 200 arc seconds, something like that. And it's the one that's doing the deep surveys right now. And it it has uh, a mirror that images the the primary on its corrector 
and then a, a, another mirror with a funny surface on it that, it, that spreads the, the, the field out. It, it corrects the image over a large field. So that's, that's the wide field camera. So that's, that's basically, I think I did, I covered all this stuff. Uh, the, the mirror, there was only one company that we could, there, there were four companies that told us they could make the, that they could make the, the funny mirror. Uh, then each one was funded. Only one of them was able to do it, Tinsley. The others couldn't do it to the, to, to the, to the accuracy we needed. And um, so, so Tinsley made the mirror, they can, and they, they've made mirrors for each instrument from, from then on out. And the technology they used, the, the computer control polishing, figuring, and the metrology, they had developed for Silicon Valley to make the mass for your computers. Uh, same technology. So anyway, uh, more detail than we need, but uh, a key thing here is that for spectrometers where you need to form an image onto a slit, uh, the two extra mirrors took away half the light at the, at the, at the short wavelengths. That's a, that, that was a penalty we just had to accept. Um, and so it, uh, it was UV friendly until we put those two in there. Uh, except there is one instrument on there, a fourth generation instrument, a far ultraviolet, goes down to maybe, a, maybe 1100 angstroms, 110 nanometers. And we put the correction on the M1 mirror and we, then we could correct over a small field, but um, too much detail. Uh, Hubble is designed to, um, to, to be serviceable. So it was launched in 1990. You all ever see it over here? Launched in 1990. And um, the first servicing mission, December 7th, 1993, I remember it well, in which um, the, the, uh, the uh, Wide Field Planetary 2 camera, JPL did that, where they, they, they put a, a corrector uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a camera and set it up. And then CoStar, which was put up to fix the, the existing instruments. Um, and then uh, around 97, 98, uh, second generation STIS and NECMOS. This is the uh, Space Telescope Imaging Spectrograph and the Near Infrared Camera Multi-Object Spectrometer. This thing does um, uh, imagery and, and, and spectroscopy out to about 1.7 microns. Um, and, okay. and then we got, okay, 2003 or so, the advanced camera for survey, and that's producing a lot of these things we see right now, the deep images, I'll show you one in a second. Uh, and then, I um, guess that's all that went in there. And then uh, uh, the fourth generation instruments, this cosmic origin spectrograph, UV, deep UV, and a thing called the, wi the uh, Wide Field Camera 3, which puts some infrared uh, capability on Hubble. So we just, it, it was upgradable, and uh, no more flights to it, though. Uh, briefly, the instruments currently on Hubble, the Vance camera for surveys, uh, third generation, big field of view, small field of view also, and uh, it has a chronograph mode, which where you, you, if you're trying to see dim objects around a bright object, you put your finger over the bright object and then look around. So that's what that is. Uh, the cosmic origin spectrograph, uh, that is the one I described where they put the, cr the, the correction on the, on, on, on the first mirror so that uh, they retain the photons and it's, it's, it's uh, looking deep for, for cosmic origins, yeah. Uh, the Nick Boss, I talked about that. Stis, talked about that. And the Wide Field 3, okay. Okay, so now let's see. Okay, this is, um, this just, well, I, Garth told me it came out a couple years ago, but it should, just got in the, in the press here recently. Uh, Hubble has been doing um, deep surveys back oh, be, while we were designing advanced cameras, so 2000 or so, uh, the Space Telescope uh, 
Science Institute decided they would pick a, por a portion in the sky where there, were, where there was nothing and they would stare. And when they, so they called these the deep, the deep surveys. And they stared and they saw tons of galaxies. And then they did more of these things. They and then this is called the extreme deep field. Uh, 2,000 separate images, 23 days of exposure. You know, it's a 95 minute orbit, so at most you could get 45 minutes of an orbit. Uh, this thing contains somewhere 5,500 or so galaxies. I'm told that nearly everything in here is a galaxy. And some of these are way out. The, they're, 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 there's a galaxy, I'll, I'll show you in the next slide, but it's within, they say 460 million light years after the Big Bang. Uh, it's uh, at 13.2 billion light years. Uh, redshift of 10.4. This thing is moving at almost 99 99% of the speed of light relative to us. It's it's moving out. But it's not the most distant galaxy that they they, they think there will, will be more distant ones. So uh, so it's right there. Um, and it was determined it was measured by filters in the advanced camera for survey, the wide field, the wide field camera, and also infrared filters, uh, the, the uh, wide field camera three. So the, this refers to uh, uh, one point oh five microns, one point two five and one point six, and these are in the visible. So the, these are in nanometers and these are in some funny units. Uh, there are also some galaxies out around here in the eights with uh, redshifts of, of eight. Uh, redshift refers to the Doppler shift, and you see it all over the place. But these, uh, Garth Illingworth, who did this survey, uh, told me they're getting a lot of science from those things. Now, the different, the different uh, generations of Hubble instruments. Um, this, 1990, this was the uh, ground base. They could see out to redshift of less than uh, about one or so. Uh, <coughs> six billion years after the Big Bang. 1995, the Hubble Deep Field, using instruments then, went out to uh, a redshift of around four within, within 1.5 billion years of the Big Bang. And they did deeper and deeper and deeper. Now they're out here right about there, half a giga, half a billion years to the Big Bang. There is another telescope coming down the pike. It's been delayed and the cost is out of sight, but they're going to build it, called the James Webb Space Telescope. It will see out to, they say, greater than 20 redshift, 200 million years from Big Bang, and the theory is that it will see the first galaxies. So, and here, here's what it looks like. Um, this, this mirror here, it's made up of 18 sub-mirrors shaped in hexes. And it, it, it folds. Uh, there's a fold here and a fold here. When, when, when it's launched, it's, it's a table fold, um, which I have a patent on, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and then this is a big sunshade that cools all this down to 40 Kelvin. It's cold. And it has infrared instruments on here that are cold, and some of their detectors get down to 5 Kelvin, near, or where, where zero is zero. So very cold detectors. Uh, this side is a spacecraft. It's room temperature. So the sun is always coming up here. This thing, it's 6.4 meters across here, and the current launch date I saw was 2018, but don't be surprised if it slips. Uh, the Goddard has started to take receipt of the science instruments that live back behind here. The telescope, that's a primary mirror. There's a secondary mirror. And the light goes through this little hole back there and gets split up to different infrared instruments. So um, it's moving down the pike. <laughs>